We can get this started. Let me just make sure tech support. Yep, here we go. Hello and welcome to Light Verse and Dark Times. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that um, everybody who wants to be here is now here and that no one's having uh, Zoom update glitches this week. But I'm going to start off by reading our roster for next week. Um, Not by recording. A little more time. Has that? Not recording yet. Oh, no, it is recording. Um, so oh. I'm going to, what I, what I do here just to refresh everyone's memory is I mute everybody and then I will attempt to unmute everybody after each poet reads so that you can hear their applause. But poets who are reading today, I recommend keeping up the grid arrangement so you can see people silently falling off their chairs and things like that. <laughs> um, it's very heartening to do that. Um, so I'm going to mute you all. If by some chance you don't get muted, I recommend muting yourself when you're listening because there's so much interference, people's dogs and kids and motorcycles outside, whatever it is, um, uh, it, it helps. So, okay, I'm doing the mute thing. Um, okay. Can you all still hear me? Thumbs up. Okay. Um, sometimes I mute myself. Okay. Um, so our readers for next week, June 14th, um, same time, same bat station will be Brian Algar, David Hedges, Jane Osborne, Robert Schechter, Catherine Tufer Yellow, and Wendy Sloan. Um, so looking forward to that and also looking forward enormously to today's readings. We're going to be going in alphabetical order and we are going to be starting with Catherine Chandler. Um, Kathy is a winner of the Richard Wilbur Award, the Howard Nemeroff Sonnet Award, and the Leslie Melichamp Prize. Kathy is the author of five poetry collections. Um, her work has been published in print and online journals and anthologies in Canada, the UK, the US, and Australia. And several of her poems were recently chosen by Canada's Poet Laureate for inclusion in the National Poetry Registry, Library of Parliament. John Mella, the founder and founding editor of Light, published her in the double edition of Light, the autumn, winter, 2010, 2011 edition. Um, also in the same issue are three more of today's readers, Pat D'Amico, Max Gutman, and David Yezzi. Catherine Chandler's poetry blog is The Wonderful Boat, and you can find that at Kathy, that's Kathy with a C and a Y, kathychandler.blogspot.com. And I'm just gonna make sure you're unmuted, Kathy. I'm doing that for you, um, hopefully. Is that working? Mm, hang on, not unmuting. Can you see if you'll be able to unmute yourself? Just click in your lower left corner. Okay, I okay. think I'm unmuted now. I think now, now you're good. Now you're okay. good. All right. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Melissa, for inviting me to read today. And thank you, everyone, for zooming in. This is all new to me, too. I'm delighted to be here. And before I begin, I would like to give a special shout out to my sister, Allison, who is an ER nurse at the Wilkes-Barre General Hospital. The first poem, A Villanelle, is spoken from the point of view of someone under stay-at-home orders in Uruguay, where I live a third of every year, just around the corner from Boulevard Artigas, named after Jose Artigas, also known as the Liberator. Cuarentena is Spanish for quarantine, obviously. Cuarentena. A pride of lions lounges on a street in Africa while I sit here inside, hobnobbing with my little parakeet. She chatters as I Instagram and tweet. We seem to take the quarantine in stride. In Wales, as gangs of goats invade a street, I FaceTime, bake, clean, sleep, and overeat. In gazing seaward from my glorified Bastille, I doubt my little parakeet is happy with her cage, her millet treat, and cuddle bone. I bet she'd rather ride the wind. As Thai macaques dash down a street, Jumanji-esque, and screaming peacocks meet in empty squares in Ronda, Spain, 
I bide my time. At least my little parakeet, free from this government-imposed retreat, may leave. And though I never thought that I'd release my little lime green parakeet, away she flies above Artiga Street. Okay, <laughs> thank you. The recent SpaceX launch reminded me of a couplet sonnet in Tetrameter I wrote inspired by the images sent from NASA's New Horizons spacecraft as it approached Pluto in July 2015. As you recall, Plato had already been demoted to planetoid or dwarf planet in 2006. For Pluto, the NASA folks are overjoyed by pictures of you, planetoid. Your nickname features Mickey, Whale, Bullseye, Donut, all but pale beside that bright white southern part, the image of a human heart. Outlier of the Milky Way, all eyes are on your face today. But nothing's new, belittled one. Under the moon, the stars, the sun. It's taken us so long to see this side of your topography that seems to tell us where to go to unearth all we need to know. Okay, thanks. So I wrote these uh, Clary Hughes this morning while I was peeling potatoes in the kitchen. Here are five Clary Hughes based on the news of this past week, which was dark and depressing and scary and bleak. One, Trump tweeted, sleepy Joe Biden was in a basement room hiding, but guess who rushed like hell to hunker down in the White House bunker? Two, Trump erected an eight foot fence for the purpose of self-defense and the politics of shitting bricks. Three, Melania is the paragon of style, but when Donald commanded her to smile at the shrine to Pope John Paul, her grin went AWOL. Four, Justin Trudeau, 21 seconds too slow, reluctant to dump on Donald Trump. And the last one. Ivanka's Bible-toting Max Mara purse is the subject of scorn and nonsense verse, but her daddy's righteous pose speaks louder than volumes of prose. <laughs> and finally, another villanelle titled, Why Did the Chicken Cross the Road? Nope, not to get to the other side. This one needed a photo op. And so with bound and determined stride, along with his ego and injured pride, Allah King brandished a sacred prop once he arrived at the other side. He never mentioned the homicide, nor paused to pray at his whistle stop. Alone at first with legs astride, this chicken not Kentucky Fried, sporting the mien of a Harley cop, stood at St. John's on the other side to show the world he wouldn't hide. The stunt was dumb and over the top, but despite his bound and determined stride and images posed and codified, the caper turned out a total flop, for he'll never get the other side and I'll never take this McNugget in stride. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for inviting you. me, Melissa. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I need a little bell or something. Okay, I have rudely muted you again so that I can move on to our next reader. Um, those who, are, who find themselves still unmuted, please mute. Um, and if you're a reader, I will make sure that you do get unmuted. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for that wonderful reading. Um, 
our, our next reader is Pat Tomiko. Um, Pat sold her first poem to the Wall Street Journal in 1986. After 14 years and 184 poems, the journal abruptly quit publishing light verse in 2000. She has appeared in Light, Lighten Up Online, the Saturday Evening Post, and Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. She's a regular contributor to Northwest Prime Time, a newspaper for people over 50 in the greater Seattle area. So Pat, welcome. Um, I'm, I think you may need to unmute yourself. Just go to your lower left corner and press the unmute. Bingo. Okay, take it away. Thank you for inviting me and please forgive my gravelly voice. I'll do the best I can. The first poem is called Squawking. Once upon a morning dreary, I awaken bleak and bleary, pondering a visage that was strutting to and fro, stealing berries from my garden, not so much as beg your pardon, causing gentle hearts to harden. How I hate that crow. The droppings have been unrelenting. My car is splattered and fermenting. I feel better after venting. Sorry, Mr. Poe. Many years ago, <clears throat> my husband was away on a business trip for 10 days. There was a lady in the building where he was working who kept flirting with him in the elevator. She finally slipped him a note, which he wisely passed on to me, and I responded with this memo to a handsome husband. Regarding the painted dolly, who works in 12-0 whatever, poor thing, she's flirting with folly, pursuing this social endeavor. I checked with Emily Post to find the correct thing to do to respond to her offer to toast with an after work drinky poo. A nice little note is required. I'd write her and say she's too kind, but you'd like to remain pre-expired. And so you have sadly declined. And if for one teensy moment, you think you would like to go, I'll be buying a dress for your funeral. I look good in black, as you know. <clears throat> the next one is called the Botox Party. The ladies lined up at the bar for their shots. The hostess provided some tasty whatnots. They tippled and toasted on wine, scotch, and gin, while the doctor injected from forehead to chin a poison concoction, diluted, of course. Then they each wrote a check that would choke a small horse. And when they went home, there was nary a line to betray that they'd lived beyond age 29. I read, <clears throat> pardon me, in Fortune magazine about an entrepreneur who was thinking about creating charcoal underwear to diffuse gastric distress, distress pardon me. So I decided to expand on his idea. This is called airing pent up problems. When the dinner you ate starts to generate a rather unpleasant aroma that you'd like to douse so a sleeping spouse isn't jolted out of a coma, an inventive mind could come up with a kind of mattress to build and then belly with charcoal and fan, I think that one can produce a flatulence alley, a straight corridor from the bed to the floor to dispel any indiscretions, and the fumes would be sent to harmlessly vent and eliminate human transgressions. The next one is a mechanic's dream. There's a chunk a chunk sound in that doodad. There's a whir and a whine in that thing. It just stopped in the rush hour traffic with a plink, a plunk, and a ping. I would like you to try to fix it since this is the closest place. And sir, 
I wish you would kindly wipe that smile off your face. This is Round Table of Righteousness. Fancy meeting you here. Good Lord, who let you in? Lucifer, Beelzebub, some nameless evil twin? We're members of the A-list. We're wholesome and we're true. We're meeting in a venue that excludes the likes of you. You're a sneaky, smooth seductress. Be gone, depart this place before I look around and see desire on some face, then we shall glow in goodness when righteousness has won, said this straight and stalwart carrot to the sinful sticky bun. And this is my last one. It's called My Goodness. They say one must heed every thought, word, and deed to be good, and I certainly try. For deeds, I'm okay. For some words, I may pay. But for thoughts, I will probably try. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Pat, for that delightful reading. Um, and you came through loud and clear, by the way. Um, our next reader is Juliana Gray. Juliana is the author of three poetry collections, including Honeymoon Palsy from Measure Press in 2017. Her poems have appeared in Best American Poetry, Birmingham Poetry Review, The Hopkins Review, and elsewhere. And her humor writing has been featured in McSweeney's Internet Tendency. An Alabama native, she lives in Western New York and teaches at Alfred University. And she has a website, um, HTTP blah, 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 Juliana Gray dot net. Um, and Juliana, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I was I was looking back at, at my files looking for some poems to read for today and um, discovered well it wasn't a new discovery but it, uh, I seem not to have written a whole lot of humorous verse since roughly November 2016. I'm not sure why that date in particular but I the world seemed a little less um, light. So I, I've, I've found three poems to read for today. Uh, the first one is actually fairly new. I, I was at the Vermont Studio Center in February, right before um, everything went into lockdown. Uh, and I, I wrote this poem there. I'm really grateful to have had the time. Whoops. And I've also got a tuxedo cat in my lap who has decided that I'm making too much noise. So there he goes. Buddy. Apologies for any cat butt who decides to try to steal the show here. That's Cooper. Okay, uh, this poem is called Guilty Party. Imagine the snacks, foie gras, veal medallions, shark fin soup, fat and suffering congealed on plastic plates, garnished with scallions. Imagine the decorations, a scattering of glitter, deflated balloons bumping your knees. The playlist is the Smiths, the National, moody stuff you burned on blank CDs whenever you felt too emotional. No one is dancing, just shifting their weight. No one dares to touch the Jenga tower. How did you get invited? Who's your date? Maybe one more drink, another hour? Do you have to say goodbye or can you ghost? Sorry, darling. Remember, you're the host. All right, I'm gonna remove this cat. Thank you. <laughs> there, that's for you, Cooper. All right. Ah, okay. Uh, the second one I'll read is um, based on a true story. Uh, it's called Home Haircuts, which I think we've all gotten more or less um, familiar with since, since March. I obviously am in, in need of one myself. Uh, home haircuts. Poised on the toilet, 
its bare lid cool against my skinny thighs. I held my spine immobile while mom trimmed my hair. I squeezed my eyes shut. A flinch or fidget meant disaster. The oops that ducked, docked my Buster Brown left me lopsided till mom pared away asymmetry, left me neck bare as a boy. Newspaper spread across my lap caught the clippings. Her dad, she spread old stories under a kitchen chair and circled him, cupping his skull like Chronic's Delilah, snipping and soothing until he got bored and stood. This is something wives do, I thought, and so I cut my husband's hair once with dull office scissors. I nicked his ear, bright blood dripping as he yelled, bolted up, and glared. He may believe even now that I did it deliberately. Tonight, I lean over the bathroom sink, trim my side-swept bangs with good shears, but still mangle the fringe as if I'd held a weasel to my face and let it gnaw. My fine mistakes flutter down in lines keeping score or a child's drawing of rain. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, and I'll read just one more. Um, this one has, uh, has an epigraph from a podcast. I listen to a lot of uh, true crime podcasts. Uh, and one that I like that some people may know of is the uh, My Favorite Murder podcast that combines true crime and comedy. That may sound weird, but give it a chance. Uh, and the, one of the hosts, um, Karen Kilgariff, who is a professional comedian, uh, provided the epigraph for the poem. Uh, the poem is called Nobody's Mother. And the line that Karen Kilgariff said on the podcast that inspired the poem was, can't you see from my really thick black eyeliner that I'm nobody's mother? Can't you see I've trimmed my home in sharp corners and glass? Don't you hear me saying fuck in every fucking sentence? Can't you see these cracks and lines around my sideways mouth were not inscribed by laughter? No locks on the stove, no controls on online porn, electric outlets gape for exploratory fork or finger. What the fuck is Gogurt? Here are my rickety stairs, here my long deferred roof bus bucking up rusty nails. Here's my liquor cabinet, a proudly shining congregation beside the household poisons. Here is my standard human heart, beating only for itself. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and yes, I can definitely relate to the, the home haircut one. In particular right now, um, I too am badly in need. Although two of my family members so far have let me come at them with scissors. Um, and I believe, I believe at least one of them doesn't regret it. So, um, all right. Our next reader is Max Gutman. Max has contributed to dozens of publications including New Statesman, The Spectator, um, Cricket, and Light um, in its print years and online. His plays have appeared throughout the US and have been well reviewed. See maxgutman.com. His book, There Was a Young Girl from Verona, sold several copies. And Max, um, I, let me make sure, yes, you're unmuted, so please go ahead and welcome. Well, thank you, Melissa. Um, I've, uh, I've selected four poems that have been in light at various times. The first one is called Success Story. I caught sight of a name I'd not thought of for ages at breakfast today in the paper, which fell from my fingers. It's rare that the paper engages my memory. This one, though, rang quite a bell. And it led me to stare toward the distance and dwell on the time we young poets were both in our primes, when I knew I'd go farther than he would go. Well, the son of a bitch got reviewed in the Times. Now, 
I know that it's not recognition that gauges success, but although it means nothing to sell lots of books or become the new fashion that rages through critical circles, I, I couldn't dispel an uneasiness, jumbling my thoughts all pell-mell. And I found myself stumped for the simplest rhymes. I just wanted to open a window and yell, the son of a bitch got reviewed in the Times. Looking back on his earlier work, it assuages my feelings a bit, though it sure doesn't quell my amazement, to think of the way he wrote pages of dull, mindless drivel you couldn't compel his own mother to look at. He hardly could spell, let alone write a poem. But, of course, these aren't crimes, and I'm not a bit jealous. I think it's just swell that the son of a bitch got reviewed in the Times. He's the prince among poets. I knew he'd excel, and he's certain to climb as Mount Everest climbs through the clouds. Just one question, though. How in the hell did the son of a bitch get reviewed in the Times? Uh, it, writing in the journal Salma Gundy, Rudolf Arnheim complained, I wish people would stop saying da Vinci when they want to refer to Leonardo. It's like saying of Vienna if they want to refer to Sigmund Freud. The poem is called Of Vienna. Of Hannibal invented Huck and took us where he rambled. Of Malaga made paintings with the people's faces scrambled. Of Byrne said E is MC squared. I'm not sure what he meant. Of Plains worked hard and grew to be a great ex-president. Despite his nine grand symphonies, of Bonn saw life as dark. The light bulb was invented later by of Menlo Park. Morality, Greek hero sly of Ithaca, was vague in, uh, unlike great fairy taler of not far from Copenhagen. Of Corsica ruled Europe, but was torn by inner tensions, his life a tragedy of, of Stratfordian uh, dimensions. Uh, depressed in exile, he would hum of Salzburg's requiem, or thinking of his downfall, mutter, oh, of Bethlehem. This next poem I usually only read if it's raining, but I figured, you know, we're joining together. You're from various places. It's got to be raining somewhere, right? Uh, this is called Rain Droppings. Can anyone make out the quality inherent in being with an umbrella that makes people without completely transparent? On the rainiest days, in the hardest of showers, people with umbrellas courteously step out of other umbrella people's ways right into ours. Or if as it starts to really pour, you dash for the shelter of a little awning, sure as rain's wet, someone with an umbrella darts under it before you. And you look at the fella as you stand in the steady downpour, but he ain't gonna budge because as any one-eyed idiot could plainly see, his umbrella is wet enough already. Beyond disputation, we already hear a lot about the many forms of indiscriminate discrimination our world has got. Still, I wish some tellered deigned to tell us the reasons for the way the umbrellard treat the umbrellas. Before I read the last one, I want to extend a special thanks to those of you who are here because I sent you the invitation. Uh, I really appreciate you taking an hour out of your Sunday to come and listen. And I need to apologize to you because what I'm about to say is probably going to mean a little bit less to you than to a lot of the others who are already familiar with John Mella, who you've already heard mentioned, the founder and longtime editor of Light Quarterly. Uh, the first time that I spoke with John on the telephone, I was on my way to the East 
Coast, where I was going to get a chance to meet with some other light contributors, uh, among them Bob McGendy, who we're going to hear from in just a moment, and Ed Conti. And John was really happy that we were all getting together, but he had a warning for me. He said, be prepared. Bob looks the way you think Ed should look, and Ed looks the way you think Bob should look. Um, and this series of readings has been a really similar experience. I've gotten the chance to adjust the way all of you people are supposed to look uh, based on the way you actually look. Um, and it's been really nice to finally have actual faces to put beside names that I've known for a long, long time. Uh, many of you will never know how much pleasure your poems have given me. So thank you, Melissa, for bringing us together this way. I really appreciate it. Um, and I know I'm talking a lot, but I feel like I just have to acknowledge the weirdness of sharing my frivolous poems at this moment in time. The things have changed quite a bit in just the few weeks since this was arranged. So um, I, I'm hoping that this hour of fun that uh, Melissa is giving us is going to help us all to uh, continue to look for ways to be strong allies and to help move our country toward uh, real justice for everybody. And if it felt like a, kind of a buzzkill to get serious that way for a few moments, wait till you hear this last poem. Um, in keeping with our theme of light verse in dark times, it's called You Only Die Once, uh, and it's in the current issue of the light. Of all the many ways to die, we each will taste just one. The rest untouched we must let lie, a smorgasbord of fun to wither with one's family near, to drive into a tree, to feel one's throat cut ear to ear. One cannot do all three. A suicide shows nerves of steel. A murder's thrilling, no? And death by accident, I feel a jolly way to go. A fall from height could give, I'll bet, a stunning journey down. But as you soar, you might regret you'll never get to drown. It's hard to truly feel content to exit just one way. And when it's over, how it went, we're not allowed to say. Thanks for listening. Max, thank you so much. That was terrific. Um, two things. Um, on the subject of reading, you know, humorous poetry in dark times, I agree that it feels strange. And on the other hand, based on what I've been hearing from people um, since the series began, and particularly um, in the past week, it's feeling more necessary to find a way to keep everyone's spirits up. So thank you for helping with that. And also, um, I hope as you were imagining what people looked like before you saw us, that you were thinking of me as kind of a Sofia Vergara type. Just, just put that out there. Um, all right, so on to our next wonderful reader. We have with us Bob McKenzie. Uh, Bob has been writing humorous formal verse since 1942. He dabbled in doggerel until 1972 when he responded to his pastor's suggestion that someone should update the Psalms. Bob takes particular pride in finding unusual venues for his verse, like The Critic, a Catholic magazine with a policy against publishing poetry, which they violated to air Bob's Psalms for the 70s. And by the way, it's 70s, PS 70s in 1973. The New York Times Sunday sports section, Seven appearances, 53 poems. The Gary Todd radio show in Indianapolis. Having seen Bob's poems in the Times poking fun at New York ballplayers, they engaged him to do the same for their sportscaster. The Baseball Hall of Fame, where he talked himself into nine speaking engagements in their bullpen theater. Um, he won, and I think he may be the only one ever to win 
the Howard Nemiroff Sonnet Award with a piece of light first. This was in 1999 and the year that Wendy Cope was the judge. Um, TV Guide, who paid him $250 for a group of poems about famous athletes and their TV commercials. The poems were never used. Their $250 was. Richard Lederer's Crazy English, Ralph Kiner's memoir, Baseball Forever, The Book of Bob, a collection of quotes from people named Susan, no, just kidding, Robert or Bob. But Bob is always delighted to be a contributor to Light, his favorite venue of all, and I did not even pay him to say that. And Bob, welcome. Um, I think you need to unmute yourself by clicking the icon on the lower left. Got it. Excellent. Please take it away. Thank you. I've been lurking in the shadows these past few weeks, uh, putting faces to familiar bylines and learning that uh, light contributors are not only very good poets, but very good presenters as well. And I've learned how to pronounce protopopescu and Galef which may come in handy someday. Anyway, thank you for inviting me to the fifth meeting of the Donald Trump fan club. I'd like to open with the first poem I had in light in the premier issue on page 13, which was my uh, favorite number. The Lion. The lethargic lion loafs all day, on occasion taking pause to pray. His lioness brought him dinner, I think. Uh, a lot of familiar bylines in this thing. Uh, we've got Gail White and Barbara Lotz on the same page, and uh, Bruce Bennett and XJ Kennedy on the facing page. Ed Conti's in there, J. Patrick Lewis, and David Galif. Gala. Yeah, I knew how to say that. Um, anyway, anybody who has a lion poem has to have a lamb poem to lie down with it. This is mine. The lamb. He gambles to the shearer's shear, and soon his woolies disappear, and thus he gets his just desserts. For gamblers always lose their shirts. My lion and my lamb are lying down together in the poets of New Jersey see, um, with another poem of mine that was more ambitious that I wrote when I found out I had to have a root canal followed by a crown lengthening, which is a euphemism for gum shortening and uh, eventually a crown and that that have to be celebrated with a poem and it should be titled uneasy lies the tooth that needs a crown and it would have to be of course a shakespearean sonnet uneasy lies the tooth that needs a crown requiring first a root canal oh dear it next must have its gum line whittled down by yet another oral engineer ground down by the inexorable drill, inured by anesthesia to the ache, its lifeblood drained, the adversary still will drive into its heart a metal stake to which to fix a gold sarcophagus, entombing one who died, alas, too young, denied fresh air that's lavished upon us and tender ministrations of the tongue. Then, when their fellow tooth's ordeal is done, on easy lie, the other 31. It would be, thank you. It would be remiss of me not to give a nod to the editors in this population who have done so much to see that I have been published places. I'll start with Melissa and Kevin, who uh, published a number of my uh, hindsight little willies about real people and their imagined childhoods, like this one about Bill Gates. 
Little Billy got his hooks in one of Mr. Steinbeck's books, then fashioned for computer venues the best laid plans of mice and menus. And Max is the one who saw to it that I got my first book of poetry not held together by Staples published. Fair game, open season on baseball, beautifully illustrated by Jim Sergi. Um, the third base coach, which appears on the back page, and I don't suppose you get close enough to get too good a look at that, but uh, it is, has a, a nice, long, and interesting backstory that I don't have time for now. But the poem is The Third Base Coach. His loins are girt, his teeth are grit, his jock itch he'll conceal. He knows that if he scratches it, he'll start a double steal. The next book, I think, in, uh, in the Doggerel Days collection was uh, edited by Gail White. And in it, I have the last word, the final poem, which was written, here's your, here's the book. Um, when I had seen the following uh, comment in the New York Post, Jets star Mark Gastineau and actress Bridget Nielsen announced yesterday they're engaged and confirmed they have each other's names tattooed on their posteriors. That was in 1988 in the New York Post. So I wrote Derriere Pensée, also beautifully illustrated. That Bridget worships Gastineau you need but read her ass to know. But, but when they have a fight next week, I bet she'll turn the other cheek. Two starstruck kids, two carefree nuts, in love, no ifs, no ands, two buts. The last poem that I'd like to do, now that was the one that ended that book, this will end my presentation. It was originally in Mellow Light, way back in the 40, 41, 42 issue, I think. Uh, and later was picked up by the, um, let's see, what is this, this is the uh, Alhambra Poetry Calendar, one poem for each day of the year. And my poem appears right after the poem at Parodies, which is Thomas Hood's I Remember, I Remember. Mine is titled I Remember, I Try to Remember. I remember, I remember my childhood domicile, a proud apartment building in the pseudo Tudor style. Three rooms, a bath, a hallway, and a Spartan kitchenette. In every room, an ashtray with a burning cigarette. I remember, I remember the radiator's knock. The old dumbwaiter in the hall where roaches ran amok. The fire escape, our balcony in the stately oak tree shade, where I would sit on summer days imbibing lemonade. I remember, I remember on the street three floors below, good humor bells in summertime, in winter, crunchy snow. And on the roof two flights above, the smell of hand-washed clothes hung out upon the line to dry. In winter time, they froze. I remember, I remember the days of World War II, its air raid drills and rationing with tokens, red and blue. I recall dad's console radio and the voice of FDR. But today I can't remember where the hell I parked my car. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you so much. That was that was just beyond wonderful. And um, I want to alert you and your fellow readers today um, that there are a lot of compliments coming up in the chat. So I hope you will all remember to check the chat. Um, uh, if you don't know how to do that, you go to the bottom where it says chat, click it. You'll see a bunch of comments. You can scroll, you can um, use the little bar on the right side to go up and down and see what people said. We are, are copying the chat. So unless, if it's not a private comment, we will get a copy of it that you will get to see. But if someone sent a thing just to you, this is your chance to see it. Um, so be sure to take a look. Um, May I quickly mention that if anybody is interested in a copy of Kiss and Part featuring uh, Bob's wonderful poem about the Gastineaus, uh, there are copies available and there are even a few copies of his wonderful Fair Game left. So if people are interested, they can contact me. Sorry for interrupting. Would you like to, um, in the chat, Todd, can you add um, a note to everyone with an address if they want to do that? That would be great. Um, and I, I should mention also that a number of other readers um, and, and some people here today also have poems and kiss and heart. Um, so um, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I even have one. So um, all right, on to our next reader. Last but definitely not least is David Yezzi. Um, David's latest books of poetry are Birds of the Air and Black Sea both in the Carnegie Mellon Poets series. His first play, Schnauzer, produced by the Baltimore Poets Theater in 2017, was recently published by Exot Books. And David, welcome. Melissa, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. And it's nice to see everybody and uh, to hear such um, uh, long uh, missed and loved names like John Mellon reminds me of uh, evening spent with Tom Dish, who I used to read regularly in these pages. Um, I, Bob mentioned, or at least I heard um, in his um, recitation, uh, an allusion, I guess, at one remove uh, in I Remember, I Remember to Philip Larkin. And so maybe I'll start with a poem uh, that uh, touches on Larkin. It's a response uh, also a response to um, to another poem or other poems. Uh, in this case, uh, to um, uh, Edward Lear's poem, How Pleasant to Know Mr. Lear, and uh, to which T.S. Eliot replied with How Unpleasant to Know Mr. Eliot. And so this is uh, in that uh, vein. Uh, this is How Pleasant to Know Mr. Larkin. How pleasant to know Mr. Larkin who demanded so little of life, three squares and a lockup to park in and freedom from taking a wife. An office with views of the college where students were rushing to lectures, field glasses to broaden his knowledge of birds or so one conjectures. He never was much fond of travel he was generally set in his ways. No evenings could make him unravel like dear Warlock Williams' soirees. He favored an endless blue sky, though was always aware it would darken. He told how we live till we die. How pleasant to know Mr. Larkin. Um, I'll, um, I'll read another poem that uh, is responding to, uh, to uh, a famous poem. And uh, I, I hope that you sort of have this in mind. I suspect everybody here does. Um, this is um, uh, what might be um, uh, James Merrill's uh, best known poem, uh, at least one of them uh, called Charles on Fire. And um, if you haven't um, read it recently or you're not remembering it exactly, it's about a evening a kind of a soiree with drinks and um, uh, Charles brings out um, a tray of drinks and a, a brash young man uh, jumps up and, and lights one of the drinks on fire and it 
the, the glass shatters and, and the, the, the liquor covers Charles's hand and, 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 and it kind of uh, sheathes it in flame uh, until he shakes it and, 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 um, uh, and, and uh, uh, gets rid of the fire. Maybe I'll just read the last few lines and then I'll read my response to it. Steward of spirits, Charles's glistening hand all at once gloved itself in eeriness. The moment passed. He made two quick sweeps and was flesh again. It couldn't matter less, he said, but with a shocked, unconscious glance into the mirror. Finding nothing changed, he filled a fresh glass and sank down among us. And so this poem um, in response to that is called uh, Charles Extinguished. Charlie was fine the next day. Nothing that an ice cube and a little unguent couldn't nurse back to the pink of health. Needless to say, the kid with the match was not invited back. Plus, who doesn't know that Paris is in France? Soirees continued much as they had before. His friends were not good looking, though quite smart and spiritual in their own way. He was down another etched tumbler or two, but hey, he could always buy replacements, yet in truth he much preferred his grandmother's antiques. Nothing was altered by the incident, except the knowledge, as he sank down among them, that for an instant he had seemed a god, all eyes fixed on him in astonishment as he assumed the blue aspect of spirit, the stuff of legend and of poetry. It was an eerie sight. His friends agree. He was no longer of them in that moment. And that restored since to his former self, he hasn't been as strange or beautiful. And um, this last is called Beatitude, though um, maybe if it had a subtitle, it would be uh, Beatitude with uh, internet headline. I think this was a meme that I came across and like all such things, it's who knows whether it's true. Um, uh, it may have been associated with uh, the research of Dr. Jane Goodall or it may not have. Uh, at any rate, uh, it's called Beatitude. And I'll end with this. Thinking back on her years among the apes, Dame Dr. Goodall could still hear the hue and cry of monkeys in the jungle scapes of Kenya's highland hills, for it was through recording them that she came to construe a larger principle behind their calls which humankind is also subject to. The loudest monkeys have the smallest balls. Like us, the jungle ape takes many shapes, from alpha male bull to Congo blue, tame laboratory chimps shilling for grapes, or the temple monkeys heard in Kathmandu. Some patiently pick nits, some climb the walls. Regardless of their type or whom they screw, the loudest monkeys have the smallest balls. The same obtains with us. No one escapes this natural law. In all that we pursue, from amped up power cords to those who traipse the slopes of Everest with a Sherpa crew, to Twitter screeds and male chimp caterwauls, Anatomy is destiny. It's true. The loudest monkeys have the smallest balls. What leads to this unlikely switcheroo? What perverse demiurge is it that scrawls this piquant maxim for the modest few? The loudest monkeys have the smallest balls. Thank you.
David, thank you so much. What a wonderful way to close our reading. Um, and uh, with a, a timeless and ever timely, ever timely poem. Um, and um, I, I want to um, remind you one more time, um, we have our final reading in this series, Light Verse and Dark Times, next Sunday, 3 p.m. Um, our readers will be Brian Algar, David Hedges, Jane Osborne, Robert Schechter, Catherine Tufriello, Wendy Sloan, and there may be one or two short surprise readings. Um, we're not sure about that yet, but I hope we'll see you all back here. Thank you so much again to all of your readers, everyone who attended. I'm going to unmute you all if people want to visit a little bit before you depart. Um, again, this has been fantastic, and thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. That was fun. Very fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.